Tunguski Meteorite, 1965. The research of 1908 to 1965 years. A note was placed on a sheet of an old calendar that a meteorite fell near the Siberian city of Kansk. This note interested Dr. Leonid Alexievich Kulik, a meteorite researcher. At that time, in Petrograd, St. Petersburg, he sought to organize an expedition for meteorites. And although the funds the Academy of Sciences of the Young Soviet State were still very limited, the need for a meteorite expedition together with Kulik was defended by famous academicians Vernadsky, Fersman and Oldenburg. Lunacharsky, People's Commissar of Education, became an ardent supporter of the initiative. And in the fall of 1921, for the first time in the history of Russian science, a meteorite expedition left for Siberia. It turned out that the meteorite did not fall in the Kansk district. But in other cities of central Siberia it was possible to find out that the phenomenon on June 30, 1908 was observed and heard by thousands of people over a vast territory. Eyewitnesses reported a colossal mass of a meteorite, a powerful windbreak in the taiga. Everything testified to the unprecedented scale of the cosmic phenomenon. In the report, Dr. Kulik names a possible fall site beyond the Podkamenaya Tunguska River. He took attention to the fact, which is still significant for scientists, the night of June 30, 1908, in Western Europe and Russia was unusually bright. The expedition returned to St. Petersburg not empty handed. 233 specimens of celestial stones have been added to the meteorite collection of the Academy of Sciences, but now it was not enough for Dr. Kulik. The Tunguska meteorite occupied his thought. Dr. Kulik was seeking for support to organize a new expedition. For this one Siberian scientist supported his research. Geophysicist Dr. Voznesinsky, the former head of the Irkutsk Observatory, reported that on June 30, 1908, the observatory's seismographs recorded strange prolonged oscillations. Comparing the reports of observers, drive. Voznesinsky found out the connection between these oscillations and the fall of the meteorite. This is the start of recording. This is an arrival of a seismic wave. An air shock wave reached Irkutsk 48 minutes later. Processing seismograms and eyewitness reports made it possible to determine the area of the crash site. According to Dr. Voznesinsky, the flight of the meteorite took place from the south and southwest to the northeast. The information, which was collected by the young geologist, future famous writer, Sergei Obruchev, and the Siberian expert Suslov, who visited the Podkamenaya Tunguska many times, coincided with his conclusions. The publication of these materials greatly influenced the decision to send a new expedition. The base of Kulik's expedition was the trading post Vanavara. At that time, state trading posts carried out very important tasks for the economic and cultural association of Avenk hunters, residents of the distant Taiga region. The workers of the trading post helped drive Kulik organize the trip, 
find guides who knew the area well. Dr. Kulik is on the left in this group. Having already visited the disaster area the previous year, Dr. Kulik in 1928 decided to get there by water. The campaign was being prepared thoroughly. Especially for the expedition, they built, Shizik, boats, as they are called in Siberia. Shizik boats are well adapted for sailing on the rough Siberian rivers. As soon as the river near the coast was free of ice, they decided to go. We walked along the Kushma River for 16 days, wrote Kulik. It had to cross it 12 times a day, overcome shallows on a horse and on own humps. Cut in the flood debris of logs. And carry own luggage with hands on the sills. We fought against the elements for 16 days. And every day, my consciousness grew stronger and stronger that with every step I was getting closer to my cherished goal. And the signs of the beginning of a windbreak more and more came across on the way. And so we went towards the hurricane of 1908. On the banks of the Kushma River, near the goal of the expedition, Dr. Kulik set up a camp. Instead of a stove there is a hot ash. You really won't complain about fishing happiness here. After tens of kilometers of fallen forest, their tree trunks became an impassable palisade on the way of the researchers. Here the road was cleared with an axe. blockage. Here it is. It could be assumed that the tree trunks lie radially forming the surface of a huge circle. Apparently the meteorite fell in the center of the circle. Over there, in the Great Swamp. Dr. Kulik had no doubt that the craters in the swamp were formed from the fall of parts of the meteorite. All 
his energy was directed towards finding and getting the remnants of the meteorite. Dr. Kulik conducts a topographic survey over an area of 100 square kilometers. Here Dr. Kulik tries to drain one of the cones. Excavation begins. However, they did not give the expected result. They didn't manage to find the remains of the meteorite in subsequent years too when the expedition was prepared more thoroughly. In addition to excavations drilling was also carried out. The expedition, which was still led by Dr. Kulik, was reinforced with new specialists. It included the botanist Shumilova, the young astronomer Krinov. Astronomical points were determined. The year 1930 came. As a result, the three-year searches were of little consolation for Dr. Kulik. The scientist never found a single gram of meteorite matter. Experts have come to the conclusion that the craters in the swamps are not associated with the fall of the meteorite. All this cast doubt on the expediency of further searches. Meanwhile, the British became interested in Kulik's research. In London, they recalled that as early as 1908, Drive Shaw demonstrated the recordings of microbarographs with disturbances of unknown origin. So from now on Dr. Cave linked them to the fall of the Tunguska meteorite. Having processed the microbarograms, the English scientist Whipple found the speed of wave propagation and calculated the order of the explosion energy. In the same years, academician Vernadsky, who very closely followed all the research of the Tunguska meteorite, and personally directed the work of Kulik, expressed an idea. It is also possible that the Tunguska event is the penetration of a huge cloud of cosmic dust into the region of gravity. At the same time, Dr. Whipple put forward a hypothesis about the cometary nature of this meteorite. His opinion was supported by the Soviet scientist Astopovich. He collected and summarized the testimony of eyewitnesses from many places in Siberia. Here are the points where the flight of the fireball was observed. Here are the places where the shaking of the ground was felt. And here are the places where blows and crashes were heard. All these phenomena covered an area of more than a million square kilometers. Dr. Ostopovich determined the direction of flight of the meteorite, which was later refined by Dr. Krinov. The explosion occurred at 016 Greenwich Mean Time. The air blast wave was recorded by many seismic stations in Siberia, propagating at the speed of sound, it reached St. Petersburg, was noted in Copenhagen, Potsdam, Zagreb, London. The air wave circled the globe twice, and the energy was then estimated and its energy was then estimated at 10 to the power of 21 ERGS. The failures of the first expeditions did not disappoint Dr. Kulik. He continued to collect meteorites and study the conditions of their fall.
Dr. Kulik was constantly preparing for a new, even deeper attack on the Tunguska meteorite, the fragments of which, in his opinion, were hidden by the southern swamp. But further research was unthinkable without aerial photosurvey of the fallen forest. And in 1938, thanks to the assistance of academician Schmidt, Dr. Kulik carried out this work. One and a half thousand pictures were received. When Dr. Kulik studied them, a convincing picture of the radial fall of the forest in the entire area around the swamp was revealed. The indefatigable researcher was charting a new program of action. Here is a page from his diary. The plan is short and clear. The work would be completed in 1943. But this expedition was not destined to happen. Dr. Leonid Alexievich Kulik, like thousands of Soviet patriots, volunteered for the front. He did not return from the war. Soon after the end of the World War II, the attention of Soviet astronomers was distracted from the Tunguska meteorite by another grandiose cosmic phenomenon. On February 12, 1947, a huge meteorite fell in the spurs of the Seacoat Allen. The Academy of Sciences sent there an expedition headed by academician Fesenkov. When scientists approached the site of the disaster, their eyes opened the very picture, that Dr. Kulik expected to see behind the Podkamenaya Tunguska. Hundreds of craters lay before them, punctured by fragments of a meteorite that had disintegrated in the air. The meteorite was iron and the magnetic metallic method was used to search for its remnants. Excavations have shown that meteorites penetrated the soft ground to a depth of 8 meters. This small piece weighs 350 kilograms. But this one is 700 kilograms. In total, about 23 tons of meteorite matter were collected. Individual meteorites were found north of the crater field. Here are the traces of reflow which appeared during the passage of a meteorite through the atmosphere. The molten metal froze on the surface in tiny trickles and balls. The same balls were found in the soil. The balls. Scientists remembered that Dr. Kulik also wrote about the silvery white balls he found in the samples. Soil samples, once brought by Dr. Kulik, have now been retrieved from the storerooms. In him, the meteorite researcher Dr. Yavnil discovered magnetite balls. 
taught by experience of studying the seacoat Allen meteorite. The researchers return to the problem of the Tunguska Fall. Create a theory of the explosion when the meteorite hits the Earth. And are engaged in calculating the trajectory and orbits. Academician Fessenkov associated the cloudiness of the atmosphere registered in California in 1908 with the dispersion of the mass of the meteorite and estimated this mass at a million tons. All the available information about the unique phenomenon was collected and analyzed by Kulik's successor Dr. Krinov. His monograph defines the tasks of future expeditions. Geochemist Florensky, having visited Podkamenaya Tunguska in 1953, confirmed the possibility of further research at the site of the disaster. And when Dr. Yavnil discovered magnetite balls in Kulik's samples, the question of a new expedition to Vanavara was resolved. The year was 1958. Thirty years have passed since the first expeditions of Dr. Kulik. Time has changed the appearance of the old small trading post. Now there is the regional center Vanavara. The astronomical point, established in 1929, it has been preserved on the main street. The expedition set off along the path laid by Kulik. Now it is impossible to recognize the cutting, which was once pierced in the taiga. The young forest that has grown since then hid Kulik's fortress near Stakovich Mount. But the huts, storage sheds. And the construction of a meteorological station have been well preserved. Many things reminds to Kulik's expedition here. And here is the Great Swamp, stubbornly keeping the secret of long ago events. But over 30 years, many scientific views have also changed. If Kulik's main goal was to search for large masses, now scientists were looking for atomized space matter. Washing was carried out using strong magnets to isolate meteorite particles from soil samples. Cosmic particles were also searched for with staffs with magnetic tips. All samples were delivered to the base of the expedition located on the banks of the Kushma.
in the samples taken in the central part of the dump. It was possible to find both magnetite and silicate balls. The balls were examined here, in the field microchemical laboratory. Chemical elements inherent in space matter were found in them. The head of the expedition, Dr. Florensky, noticed that with the distance from the center of the disaster, the number of balls in the soil increased. It is necessary to expand the search area. The invention of travelers is the spinning, raft. In difficult routes, such lightweight instruments are also suitable for sample enrichment. The expedition also conducted research of the entire area of the fallen forest. The boundaries of the felling, the nature of the damage were clarified. The influence of the terrain on the direction of the felling of trees was studied. As a result of these works, the first schematic map of the entire area of the fallen forest was compiled. It was made on an accurate topographic basis. The map was supplemented by a more thorough survey of the Tiger in 1961. The entire area of the disaster covers 2,000 square kilometers. The 1961 expedition was the most numerous during the entire study of the Tunguska Fall. It was represented by a large team of scientists of various specialties. They were joined by an amateur expedition that began field work back in 1960. In the taiga, more than 120 taxation sites were established, where the direction of the fall was studied in detail. The party was led by engineer Plekhanov. His group also studied the accelerated growth of trees after the 1908 disaster. and the nature of their burn. It is known that at that time the public interest in the Tunguska Fall was supported by the fantastic assumption of a nuclear explosion of a spacecraft. Young enthusiasts have tested these assumptions. The rings of 1908 were taken from the tree cuts and burned. The ash was subjected to radiometric studies. No increase in radioactivity was observed in any case.
At the same time, the expedition conducted research in the swamps. Also, as in the search for the masses of the seacoat Allen meteorite, the magnetometric method was applied here. But the working conditions at Podkamenaya Tunguska turned out to be much more difficult. No magnetic masses were found at the bottom of the Great Swamp. Experts came to the conclusion that all depressions and folds of peat are of natural origin and are not associated with the fall of the meteorite. It became apparent that he exploded in mid-air before reaching the ground. There is Lake Checo. It also called as Swan Lake. It is the only large water surface near the site of the fall. Usually, in layered lake silts, as in tree rings, sediments of each year could be distinguished. The search for particles of cosmic matter continued on a larger scale than before. Scientists managed to find out the direction of magnetite ball's concentration. It drives northwest of the epicenter. And now it has already been traced for 400 kilometers. In 1962, the work of the expedition was transferred to Mutari on the bank of the Chunya River. Soil samples were taken from the tops of the hills. The soil from the bottom of the lakes was examined too. From distant routes, samples were delivered to the camp by helicopters. Their preliminary processing was carried out in a field laboratory. And all basic research was launched in Moscow at the Vernadsky Institute of Geochemistry and Analytical Chemistry. Here, special facilities were used to isolate magnetite balls from samples. At the dresser, the entire mass is sorted into fractions.
the magnadrum extracts magnetite particles from heavier fractions. And on the vibration bed, from these grains, the very balls are separated. That the researchers so stubbornly hunted for. A few hundreds of a millimeter in size balls were subjected to thorough chemical analysis. To carry out such an analysis, unique equipment was required. Here, for example, scales on which you can weigh a speck of dust with an accuracy of billionths of a gram. Miniature manipulators place the ball in a reactor, the working diameter of which is no larger than that of the straw. The preparation obtained in the reactor is separated into fractions using a centrifuge. They could be observed only under a microscope. Simultaneously with ultra-microchemical research, the Institute carried out X-ray spectral analysis of the beads. This method allows one to investigate the chemical composition of a dust grain at its specific points. Analyzers have shown that nickel is distributed very irregularly in the balls. Its content decreases sharply from core to shell. But what caused such a big difference in nickel distribution? Is this related to the origin of the balls? The experiment had to give the answer. In Florensky's laboratory, minerals characteristic of cosmic bodies were investigated. When tiny grains of sand were melted, gases were released and complex chemical processes took place. And so, artificial balls were obtained. The results of their analyses coincided with the results obtained before, and confirmed the cosmic origin of the particles found in the tiger soil. The study of the Tunguska Fall is part of the big problem of the interaction of space matter with our planet. Research in this direction, conducted in our country, is headed by academician Vinogradov.
work related to the problem of the Tunguska Fall was carried out in a comprehensive manner by a number of scientific institutions. Surveyors processed the materials of aerial photographs of Kulik and received a map that supplemented and refined field data. It served as the basis for conducting an experiment in a model that repeated the whole picture of forest felling. The woodland was imitated with soft wires. The explosion of the detonating cord caused a ballistic wave, and the explosion of the charge simulated the rapid decay of the meteorite. at Schmidt Institute of Physics of the Earth. These experiments were carried out by researchers Sikulin and Zotkin. The ballistic wave played an important role in the transformation of the forest destruction zone. Here, as in the Tunguska taiga, there is no debris at the epicenter of the explosion. Now, based on objective criteria, the trajectory of the movement has been clarified and the total energy of the meteorite falling has been determined. The burn nature of the Tungus tiger trees was studied at the main botanical garden of the Academy of Sciences. Here they set up experiments with the simulation of a radiant burn. Preliminary results confirm the assumption about the light origin of the burn. Its energy was not great. It has already been said that the falling night was unusually bright in a number of places. In the Committee on Meteorites of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR, the boundaries of light phenomena were clarified. They spread over a large part of the northern hemisphere to the west of the crash site. Academician Fesenkov saw this as one of the proofs of the cometary nature of the Tunguska catastrophe. The cometary nature of the Tunguska explosion was also evidenced by the huge felling of the forest and the unusually large force of the airwave, substance and the absence, except for magnetite and silicate balls, of any meteoritic substance. And, finally, the orbit characteristics of the cosmic body. Yes.
it was undoubtedly a comet. Science already knows a lot about amazing bodies coming from distant regions of space. Comet nuclei are composed of frozen gases with small refractory substance and inclusions. They are destroyed by exposure to sunlight. Humanity remembers many cases of the Earth's approach with comets. But why did nobody observe the Tunguska comet? Because it could not be seen before meeting the Earth. The comet approached the Earth in the daytime sky from the direction of the Sun. Its tail from a cloud of cosmic dust lingered in the atmosphere at an altitude of 600 to 800 kilometers above the northern hemisphere causing bright nights there. The nucleus with cosmic speed penetrated into the more dense layers of the atmosphere and scattered into pieces, which turned into a dense swarm of small particles surrounded by a single shock wave. At the altitude of about 10 km, a sharp deceleration began. At the moment of the explosion, all the remaining mass scattered and was blown away by the wind. Far to the northwest. Such was the course of the catastrophe which broke out here more than half a century ago. While meteorite craters remain on the Earth's surface for tens of thousands of years, the traces of an air explosion quickly disappear and are covered with young forest thickets. If the Tunguska Fall is the only known case of a collision of a comet nucleus with the Earth, then we can confidently assume that such meetings have happened before. Chief Consultant Academician Fesenkov VG. Consultants Zotkin IT, Florensky KP, Yavnil AA. Film Director Gradov Israel Cesarevich. Author of text, Shaining. Music Smirnova V. Mosnarch Film 1965 The End <laughs>